start with Gina. Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so... Uh, now we are waiting for Lee, Tyler and uh, Mama. Well, uh, uh, let's go ahead and get started because I don't think Mark says okay. anything until Possibly later now. on and Tyler's Next not going to be able to talk anyway, so. Next slide. Next slide. So now is uh, my turn to welcome you all. So namaste and a good morning and a good evening to everyone. So we thank you and welcome you all with this short notice for the training. So we are very thankful to the participants from the different hospital, doctors, physician, nurse, and the focal person from the all the uh, four hospital. So we are honored to welcome and thank you to Dr. Joshi, hospital director, uh, and uh, Dr. Basuda Sresta, senior consultant microbiologist for presenting and sharing the expert and experience as a resource person for this training. So uh, we are very much grateful to uh, our international expert from the Henry Ford Health System for the technical assistance for this program. So we heartily welcome Dr. Marcos. So maybe he will join after a few minutes. Uh, Marcos is here. And Dr. Gina Mackey, physician, infectious disease division, Henry Ford Health System. And uh, Dr. Linda Kalji, senior investigator, Tyler, program coordinator from Henry Ford Health System Global Health Initiative. Our entire team would like to acknowledge them for their continuous support and the guidance. So we welcome you all for this learning process and with your cooperation and support. We'll make, we'll make a success of this glamour telemedicine project uh, with your support. So thank you, welcome you all. Uh, so now I would like to request all of you to introduce yourself. Uh, maybe we can start from the Linda from the Energy for the Health System. Linda. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Linda Kalji, um, as uh, Deepak said, from Henry Ford Health System Global Health Initiative. So, Gina. Hi, I'm Gina Mackey. I'm an infectious disease physician at Henry Ford Health System, also working with the Global Health, Health Initiative. Um, I've been working in Nepal for a while and enjoy working with everyone and miss being there. Okay. Uh, so Tyler, I cannot see in the screen, so maybe he is not here. So Marcus, okay. he can join later on. Yeah. Uh, so now can we move to the uh, Dr. Joshi and the Basuta uh, as a resource person? Dr. Joshi? Dr. Joshi, Dr. Sir, please introduce yourself. Dr. Joshi, could mute. Dr. Joshi, mute my own sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Joshi is in the mute. So, Basuta ji, why not you start? Uh, Dr. Joshi, go ahead. Introduce yourself. I am Dr. Adi Joshi. Hospital director, Kashmir Model Hospital. And Dr. Joshi is a resource person for this training, and uh, he will guide us all the process of telemedicine for the upcoming days also. Basutaji. Namaste, good evening and good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Basuda Sresta, Senior Consultant Microbiologist of Kashmandu Model Hospital. I'm taking a class on antimicrobial resistance in this training session. Thank you. You must welcome. So next, can we start from the BPKIS, Dr. Deepak Yadav? Why not you start first? Ah, yeah, thank you, Deepak, sir. Uh -huh. Good evening, everyone, and good morning, our uh, Henry Ford System, uh, Global Initiative uh, Health System. Uh, uh, Dr. Linda, uh, Dr. Uh, Taylor, uh, Gina Kazi, Saul. Uh, respected our resource person, myself, Dr. Deepak Kumar Yadav, working BP Kora Institute of Health Science, School of Public Health, and community medicine here as a additional professor and uh, we have our team here uh, and i'm the focal person from the pkhs 
Thank you all. So from other colleague from the DPKIS, please go ahead, introduce yourself. DPKIS, other colleague. Hello, good evening, uh, all of you. I am Dr. Tataran Layadu, a resident doctor uh, in BBK Sajaran, in faculty of, uh, in department of uh, general practice and emergency medicine. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Next, please, DPKIS, yeah. Namaste and good evening. I'm Jenisa Shrestha from Dharan. I'm currently working at BPKIHS at Emergency Department as a staff nurse. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please, BPKIHS. Namaste. I'm Sushmita Yadav. I'm, I'm a nurse. I'm working in BPKIHS at Dharan. Yeah, next, please, one more from the BPKIHS. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. I am Dr. Roshan Dakar from BPKHS, uh, working in the Department of Community Medicine. So, thank you, thank you, Dr. Dakar. And uh, uh, from Sheti Journal Hospital, Provincial Hospital. Of course, little bit, I, I want to add that these are our team. Uh, yeah. Dr. Roshan, Dr. Saturanan, uh, and Jenisa, and uh, all. Yeah. So, um, uh, we all with with you and in this team. Thank you. Thank you. So from Shanti Provincial Hospital. Uh, namaskar and good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Sirvadu Kamar, Senior Consultant Physician, Shanti Provincial Hospital. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. So this uh, from Shanti Hospital. Yeah. Namaste, everyone. I am Dr. Pradeep Mishra working pediatrician in Seti Provincial Hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. So next. Good evening, sir and ma'am, everyone. I am Kishor Sesta, medical recorder officer, Seti Provincial Hospital, Angadi Kaidali, Far West, Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Kishor Ji. Next, please, in from the Seti Hospital. Okay, other two, two maybe join later on. Kishor ji, aru aru saatheru unu na. I mean, tin jana matra ho. Kya wada? Wada contact the gare ko koi line ma unu baasai na. Okay, why not you give a call? Maybe if they can join because today is a training. You know, everybody should be there in the you know this training program. So can we move to the Kathmandu Model Hospital? Kathmandu Model Hospital. What's the other side? Dr. Muna, Muna Palike. Namaste. Good Hello. evening. I'm Dr. Muna Palike. I work as a registrar in Department of Medicine in Kathmandu Model Hospital. Thank you, Doctor. So next, please, from Kathmandu Model Hospital. Hello, I'm Rima Sivakuti from Kathmandu Model Hospital. I work as a nurse in medical ward. Thank you. You must welcome. Thank you. Next, please. So Anuvam Takal will join after a few minutes anyway. So if there's a nobody from the Kathmandu Model Hospital, can we ask to the Kritipur Hospital? Kritipur Hospital Ko Ununja. Namaste. I am Dr. Pratik Raj Karnika. I am working as internal medicine registrar at Kitipur Hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Next, please, from Kitipur Hospital. Hello, Namaste, everyone. My name is Pranita Moharjan, and I am working as a ward in charge in Kitipur Hospital in General Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please, Dr. Okay, so now uh, from the hospital, now we will introduce ourselves. I'm going to for the annual. I'm Deepak Bajrachaje from the group for technical assistance. Namaste, I'm from Bajrachaje from group for technical assistance. Good morning and uh, good evening to everyone. I'm Bolanath Chaudhary from GTA. Namaste, I'm Nishman Joshi, meal manager from GTA. 
So Nilesh Man Joshi is a focal person for the, this project. So if you have any questions, you can you know send a mail to him. Uh, namaste, I'm Lenjana Jimmy from GTA. Namaskar, I'm Chitis Garbi from Group for Technology. So if anybody join uh, later on, they can introduce themselves. Now maybe we'll continue, Linda, is okay? Sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Um, so we can start. I just had an email from Mark and he's in clinic now. So um, he probably won't be able to join us. Okay. Okay, okay but slide. let's go ahead and start. Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Nilesi, can you put it in? Okay. So Linda, okay. now your turn, yeah. Next slide, yeah. So uh, I know, I think everyone was here uh, when we met uh, earlier this week. Uh, so this is just a quick overview of Glamour, uh, and then we will move on to the training. Um, as you know, Glamour is a web-based uh, repository for curriculum, lectures, and resources um, to um, supplement uh, both this training and trainings we've done in the past, um, and to support uh, AM. Uh, AMS or stewardship programs in health facilities in Nepal. Um, the uh, original web platform was launched uh, November 2020. Uh, and this particular, uh, this new second year uh, is a program that is running between uh, last October 2020 and September 2021. Next slide. So uh, we are, um, this is our face to, uh, well, our, our virtual training um, and that with um, hospitals in three regions in Nepal. Um, and we will uh, be training uh, our physician and nurse champions or AMR champions uh, during this time. Uh, we will also ask you to complete the uh, web-based training um, and there are two tracks on the platform. One is for the champions and the other is for healthcare providers. So um, once you've completed your training, we will ask you to support other providers in your hospital to um, go through the, um, the web-based um, training. Um, and we, the, we will support both synchronous and asynchronous interactions. So like today, we will continue to have um, some meetings so that you have opportunities to ask questions. Um, and uh, hopefully in the, in the long run, what we want to have available uh, is a program set up so that you can ask um, questions and get back um, very short term responses uh, from experts either in Nepal or in, um, in the uh, other international settings about specific cases. This is sort of a preliminary to setting up um, the full telemedicine um, program. And one more slide. Uh, I, I showed this last, um, last time, so I won't go through this, but again, as you can see, there are a variety of different modules um, uh, a few extra modules for champions, uh, which really focus on um, the WHO toolkit and implementation of AMS programs in hospitals. And uh, I will have a brief presentation about that um, later on. Yeah. And the next slide. So there will be an evaluation. Um, so we'll have qualitative interviews we may at least initially, um, those will just be written questions that we will ask to understand how the process is working and um, any challenges that you are having with the process. Um, we will also, at the end of um, every, once everyone has gone through all of the training, um, there will be a three month period where we will ask you to, the physicians, the prescribing physicians, so anyone who's prescribing, to keep a brief logbook of any recommendations that they make. Um, and so once everyone has been through the training, we will, we will discuss that in more detail. Um, and I think, and, and I, don't, I haven't actually discussed this with Karki and Deepak, but 
Um, hopefully everyone, if they can get through their training by the end of February, um, then uh, starting in March, then we can start um, this portion of the, the three months of the evaluation with the log books. Okay. So thank you everyone, uh, if there are any questions, but again, that was just a quick overview uh, to summarize what we discussed um, the other day in the kickoff meeting. Hi, I'm Dr. Gina Mackey, um, and we will be talking next about a quick overview on antimicrobial resistance and infection prevention and control. And then Dr. Joshi will touch on the antibiotic dispensing. Yes. Um, we cannot hear you, Gina. We kind of put them. Oh. You have some problem in your computer. We cannot hear you. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me again? Yeah, now we can hear you. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry, I think I cut out there. Can you hear me again? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> um, but so put together a short overview to kind of hit big points. Um, so we'll get started on that. So first off, what is antimicrobial resistance? So this is the ability of a microorganism, like such as bacteria, viruses, and some parasites, to stop an antimicrobial such as the antibiotics, antivirals, or antimalarials from working against them. Um, as a result, when this occurs, standard treatments become ineffective. And once these resistance, resistant organisms are there, they can easily spread between person to person. Next slide. Excellent. And so one important thing to think about when you're prescribing antibiotics is the change that it can make for a prolonged period in the person that you're prescribing the antibiotic to. So you might think you're only giving a very short course of a very weak antibiotic for five to seven days. But what's important to note is that even though you think you didn't do much, it can alter the flora of the GI tract. And so there was a study that showed that once, this, once these people received antibiotics, they found a change in the flora that became more resistant. And those resistant organisms were there detectable for up to two years. And so even a short course, oh, sorry, let's see. Is this more clear? Thank you. I think your mic is more echo, you know, is is not so clear. So I think there is some problem in your mic. Maybe if, is everyone okay, else let's... on mute? Is everyone on mute besides Gina to make sure that there's less echo? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that more clear? Yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead, Gina. Okay, is that more clear now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so uh, just to re summarize this slide, this is just showing that even a very short course of antibiotics can create resistant organisms within that host, within the person that the antibiotics were given to for an up to two years duration. And so it's really important to think twice before giving an antibiotic and to really think, does this person have a bacterial infection that requires an antibiotic before giving it? This comes up a lot, especially for a viral illness um, where people don't need antibiotics but are given antibiotics and then we develop resistance in those patients unnecessarily. Next slide. And so this just talks about the uh, cycle, essentially, uh, that antibiotics play in developing resistance. 
And so when we increase our use in antibiotics, we find we increase the strains of resistant organisms. When we have organisms with multi-drug resistance, we end up having ineffective empiric therapy for those uh, infections. With ineffective therapy, we have to increase hospitalizations, often using our bigger gun antibiotics that require intravenous therapy. This along leads to increased use of health resources. It's more days in the hospital, increased risk of hospital acquired infections, and increased amount of patients in the hospital with increased hospital days. We also have limited treatment alternatives with the more and more resistance we've seen. I'm sure anyone who's been in the hospital for a while has seen patients who have organisms that are resistant to all available antibiotics. And this unfortunately is becoming more and more common. And again, that brings us back to the beginning of the cycle where we use more antibiotics to try to treat these infections. And so just remember that antibiotic use is the key driver to developing resistance. Next slide. So what can we do to help antibiotic resistance? So antibiotic stewardship is one of the most important tools we can use to help save the antibiotics that we have. It's important to note that there's not many new antibiotics coming out on the market. And often the ones that come out are combinations of our older antibiotics. They still develop resistance quickly. And there's very few new antibiotic um, classes. And so since we can't rely on yeah. new antibiotics or more antibiotics, we have to try to do what we can to make sure the current antibiotics we have continue to work. And so stewardship programs have been shown to improve patient outcomes as well as patient safety. They reduce resistance and then they've been shown also to have a reduced cost for both the hospital and for the patients. Next slide. So how are antibiotics overused? So this was a study that looked at um, the different various ways that people were found to have improper use or overuse of antibiotics. And they found most often that it was increased quantity or too much of the antibiotic or poor quality, either wrong choice, maybe too broad, um, unnecessary. And so you can see in this study here, they found about 30% were excessive duration. Um, so if you find the infectious disease guidelines, you can find if you look now compared to 20, 30 years ago, they really have shortened the duration. We continue to find that shorter durations are effective with less risk. And so it's important to use the shortest effective duration. 32% um, found no bacterial infection. So that brings us back to, do you actually need the antibiotic in the first place? Um, and just of note, they found 30% of antibiotic days were inappropriate overall. Next slide. So some useful stewardship tips. So when you're prescribing antibiotics and working with patients, these are some things you always wanna be thinking about. Um, so always important when possible to get bacterial cultures and the highest yield will be prior to antibiotic use. And so if able, you want to try to obtain the cultures before you give the first dose of antibiotics. Once someone's been on antibiotics, your yield for a positive culture becomes much lower. Also important to stay up to date with your hospital's antibiogram. And so I know Basuda always creates a wonderful antibiogram, and this can be different within different hospitals, even in the same city. Um, if you don't have an antibiogram within your own hospital, you can look at neighboring hospitals as they're probably similar, but this will show you in, in your population how much resistance is there to specific antibiotics. Another point is the quinolone. So the quinolone antibiotics, they develop resistance quite easily. And so we prefer to avoid those for empiric use. Um, we are okay with transitioning to them, especially if you find that they are already sensitive, but
but try to avoid them as your first choice. And then look for duplicate antibiotic coverage, uh, which is almost always unnecessary. So if, for example, if you're using um, piperacillin, tazobactam, or another combination that has anaerobic coverage, you don't need to add metronidazole, for example, because they're both anaerobic uh, coverage. So always just look at what's prescribed and look, do you have any duplicates? Can you take away an antibiotic that's not giving you any extra benefit? Next slide. So infection control, this goes hand in hand with stewardship. So like we just spoke about, stewardship is important to try to prevent development of resistance. Infection control helps with, once that resistant organism is already there, trying to prevent the spread from one hospital to another hospital, or sorry, one patient to another patient, or between hospitals as well. Um, the infection prevention control program has three goals. First off, you want to protect the patient. You want to protect each patient from getting a hospital-acquired infection or an infection transmitted from you yourself as a healthcare provider. You also want to protect the healthcare worker. So just as we don't want to infect our patients, we don't want to get an infection from our patients. That does no good for ourselves and doesn't help us care for other patients either. And then doing so in a cost-effective manner. So cost is always important. It's a limited resource. And so you want to try to think what is the most cost-effective way I can help prevent infections from spreading and developing. Next slide. So one of the main things that we can do is hand hygiene. And so hand hygiene is a very inexpensive measure, and it is one of the most important measures that we've found to be beneficial in preventing infections from spreading. And so uh, good hand hygiene before and after each patient contact can reduce hospital-acquired infections. A large majority of hospital acquired infections are preventable. And multiple studies have shown that hand hygiene is one of the main players in reducing the hospital acquired infection rates. Next slide. And so, what is important to remember for when you're using hand hygiene? So, if you have an alcohol based sanitizer, this is appropriate. You can use that in place of washing your hands, except in a couple scenarios. So if your hands are visibly dirty, you need to use soap and water. You cannot use a, a sanitizer effectively. Also, uh, certain infectious etiologies, especially when we think of Clostridium difficile, sanitizer or alcohol will not kill the spores. And so you physically need to wash the spores off your hands. So so you can still spread the disease if you only use sanitizer. And make sure you're using a good amount. So you want to make sure the sanitizer is covering the whole surface of your hands and rub together your hands until it's completely dry. And then you should be effectively killing the bacteria and viruses on your hands. Next slide. And uh, like I uh, preluded to, a hand hygiene should be done right at the point of care. Um, so I know it's not always easy to find the hand sanitizer, but if you're noticing that you're going to see a patient and you have to walk down the hallway to find hand sanitizer, that's something to bring up to the hospital administrator or environmental service to try to increase the amount of places there are hand sanitizer. Um, so either put it on a cart that you can take with you from patient to patient was a, that is effective, or if there's rooms, you can place them on the walls between um, patients. And so, of course, if people have to walk out of the room to go find soap or hand sanitizer, it's going to make staying, um, staying with good hand hygiene a lot more difficult. So keeping it within reach for each patient is, is key. Next slide. Um, also, we want to remember surface contamination. So our hands are obviously a big source for bacteria, but also when cleaning the environment, we want to think of high-touch surfaces. So 
I think often I see, you know, the floors being kept very clean, but also we need to think about, um, you know, any handles, doorknobs, um, computers, any shared equipment as well. Uh, these can definitely harbor a lot of bacteria and they often harbor are very virulent and hard to kill bacteria that cause severe infections. Um, so just make sure that whoever's responsible for cleaning the patient areas is also targeting the high touch areas. Next slide. Um, and another important part of infection control is personal protective equipment. I think this has come to light more than ever during the era of COVID. Um, and so different precautions will be there for different uh, disease processes. So standard precautions are always using good hand hygiene. Um, sometimes we need additional precautions. So if you're touching, you know, blood or any secretions, using gloves is important. Um, if you think you're going to be splashed, such as in a procedure or surgery, then using a gown and a face shield or goggles is important. Um, for certain organisms that are very resistant, we try to do contact precautions using a gown and gloves to, in an effort to prevent transmission between patients. Um, droplet precautions, everyone I think is very aware of this now with COVID, um, but other viruses such as influenza as well require droplet precautions and that would be using a mask. And then airborne isolation, um, is really for mostly tuberculosis, measles, and disseminated varicella. So since those can persist in the air for a long time, having a respirator mask around those patients when possible is important. Next slide. So in summary, antimicrobial stewardship and infection control play a very important combined role in stopping the spread of antibiotic resistance and the development. And stewardship is important to decrease resistance from developing, where infection prevention and control is important to stop the spread of the resistant bacteria and other organisms. And just always remember and always promote hand hygiene as it is the biggest, most important thing we can do to stop the spread of infection. And thank you, I think that's all for me. And I think Dr. Joshi um, will describe the antibiotic dispensing guidelines. Dr. Joshi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now I, we can hear you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gina. That's quite nice about you talk about this antibiotic steroid and the resistant pattern also. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking a sort about this antibiotic dispensing guidelines. Next slide, please. Antibiotic dispensing guidelines, that's a statement and recommendation with the intent guide this decision in order to optimize patient care base of review of evidence and that is intended to feed the majority of the patients, though it's not 100%, but we say majority of the patient. However, there has to be individualization of each patient should it still be addressed. So we have the guidelines, but individualization is also necessary that we have to address ourselves. Next slide. So in these guidelines, first, what it comes to is to improve the patient's outcome and the quality of the care also. And then to reduce the inappropriate variation in practice. So depending or not depending on the doctors, uh, like you know, different, different hospital, you can have a different practice. It has to be, you know, re reduce inappropriate variation in the practice also. And we have to encourage our proven treatment also. And the same way we try to, edu we have to educate our providers, healthcare providers, whether other consultants, uh, uh, I mean, uh, registrar levels, even uh, we have nurses also, and even other healthcare or the providers. Then that will improve the efficiency of the healthcare also. Next slide. 
we have current guidelines for the Nepal stewardship program are mostly adopted here in the 2019 guidelines here that include we have the empirical use of the antibiotics then they have definite use of antibiotics we have the duration time like between five days up to two weeks also based on the indications and we have of course we try to use into oral numbers and as a renal patient then we have to think of the renal dosing also next slide Here, this is just a simple, I mean, we are trying to show this in the, I mean, like examples. So if the suspected pathogens are, yes, pneumonia, then we try to give empiric therapies for the safe traction plus azithromycin for five days. Then we have mycoplasma, chlamydia species. We try to give doxy or amoxiclab also. Legionella for the especially we give boxy uh, fluxation. These are like just a guidelines I, I want to show, you know. That's what we are doing. Uh, next slide. Now, as we have discussed, you now we discussed about this. Even Dr. Linda has told us about this, and Dr. Gina also told us this. There are very few antibiotics on reserve in pipeline, so we have to be very careful about how to keep this antibiotic on reserve. Well, there's a categorization by the WHO is about assess, watch, and reserve. They are recommended to be used as the last resort options. When there is no alternative, other alternatives have failed. The main our aim is to preserve the effectiveness of these antibiotics. Like the, these are the line like azotonum, shebipaim, daptomycin not available in Nepal, and then polymyxin. That's what we have been using: polymyxin B and colistin, tigacycline, linozolid, and posomycin. Next. So. Did you any questions? Hello. Thank you, Dr. Joshi um, and Gina. Um, does anyone does anyone have any questions for either Dr. Joshi or uh, or Dr. Gina? You can use the chat box also if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, sir. A very nice uh, presentation and very much informative. Hello, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, we can hear yeah, you, Deepak. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, fine. So uh, last uh, last slide, little bit I'm worried about the, uh, our uh, antibiotics on reserve. Yeah. So this is very, very important and uh, how to like best use of this antibiotics so that in future, our for, uh, future generation can be stay healthy and like, uh, yeah, uh, with the all uh, infestivity. So, uh, I mean, uh, uh, linezolid uh, uh, nowadays uh, very widely using our community, but uh, we know that this is a very uh, good drug for respiratory disease, for the TV, I mean, in TV control, for NDRTV. So, um, please, uh, yeah, take care of this linezolid, especially. And other drugs also, these like six or seven, uh, yeah seven drugs over here we have, we have with us. So thank you, sir, for this information. Like, you know, linozolid is quite cheaper, I mean, I mean comparatively. But uh, other medicine like polymexin, cholestine, and TG cycle is quite expensive. So sometimes we think that it's better to have the expensive medicine for the job, you know, if it's expensive, so that we don't need <laughs> Yeah, expensive care is here. So like, I, as uh, Dr. Gina talked about quinoline, I mean, you know, like we remember when that was in 90s, uh, 2090s, when ciprofloxacin came, it was quite expensive. Or fluxacin used to cost about more than a, for us, it was very expensive, more than a dollar. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that time, everybody was saying, oh, so expensive drug. So now you can get in for like five pence, you know, 50, uh, less than five rupees. That's why the, one of the reasons the quinolones had. Uh, uh, Develop so much of resistance, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, and others are also very, very cheap now in Nepal. So, I mean, even CBPM is expensive, uh, polymedin, colicin is expensive, but we have seen that this type of uh, mainly three medicine, I will talk about the polymedin, colicin, tg cycline. We have seen big hospitals 
bigger the hospitals, more sophisticated the hospitals, they try to use these type of antibiotics. And the, most of the patient, though it's expensive, they have to, I mean, uh, use it. And then if we develop uh, resistance in this medicine, then after that, we don't have any other medicines. So that is what we, we all the physicians, treating doctors have to think about whenever we prescribe this last resort, you know, those are the couple of medicine we have here. Thank you, Dr. Deepak, for this comment. Any more questions? I think, uh, Linda, you can take over the mic. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I think we'll just uh, move uh, on. Uh, next, we have um, Dr. Basuda Shrestha, um, the lead uh, consultant um, microbiologist from Kathmandu Model will expand on information about antimicrobial resistance. Welcome and yeah. uh, good evening once again, everyone. I am Dr. Basuda from the Kathmandu Model Hospital. So I talk about the antimicrobial resistance. So next slide, please. So the antimicrobial resistance, that means antimicrobial means that is against the bacteria, parasites, and the viruses. So here, what we talk about today is about the antibacterial resistance. However, everybody says antimicrobial resistance for antibiotic resistance as well. So all of us know that the struggle of the mankind against infectious disease is well known. The discovery of the antibiotics exactly. led to optimism that infections can be controlled and prevented. However, infections are still the leading cause of the death in the developing world. That is, this is due to the emergence of the new disease, the emergence of the diseases once controlled and the more specifically due to the appearance of the antimicrobial resistance. Now, actually, what is antimicrobial resistance then? Antimicrobial resistance is the ability of a microorganism to stop an antimicrobial, such as the antibiotics or antivirals and the antimalarial from working against it. As a result, standard treatments become ineffective and infections persist and may spread to others. The rise of the antibiotic resistance is leading to the untreatable infections, which can affect anyone of any age and in any country. Next slide, please. So without urgent action, we're heading for a future in which infections and the minor injuries could once again kill us. So this is the picture from the lecture from the 1945 of the Alexander Fleming's here. He's, at that time, he said that it is not difficult to make the microbes resistance to penicillin. And at the time when he discovered the penicillin, he already speculated that the time may come when the penicillin can be bought by the, anyone in the shops, then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to the non lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistance. And now today it became true. So next slide, please. So development of the resistance in the microbes is ruled by the Darwin's theory of the survival of the fittest. So next slide. So have an overlook of the history of the antibiotic discovery. Here we can uh, see in this picture, in the, from the 1928 penicillin was discovered by Fleming. Then in 1932, sulfonamide uh, was discovered. And afterwards, 1940, aminoglycoside in the 50, chloramphenicols, uh, microliths in the uh, 1960, and then till 1990, most of the antibiotics were discovered till 1990, and now the discovery is wide. So no registered classes of the antibiotics were discovered after 1987. The so next slide. So before coming to the a mechanism of action of 
the uh, bacteria against the anti uh, antibiotics let's see how the antibiotics works against the bacteria here there are the, the antibiotics are classified on the basis of the mechanism of the action in this picture we can see how the antibiotics works against bacteria first of all the structural integrity among the bacterial uh, cell wall synthesis inhibitor or the cell membrane synthesis inhibitor drugs are beta lactams penicillins cephalosporins vancomycins in the case of the cell membrane synthesis inhibitor drug is polymyxin and sulfonamides are the uh, they interfere with the essential metabolites and another one is interference with the nucleic acid synthesis are nitric acid fluoroquinolones and rifampin similarly 30s unit ribosomal unit inhibitors are aminoglycoside tetracyclines and the tz cycline 50s inhibitor drugs are erythromycin clindamycin chloramphenicol linezolid and streptogramin next slide so the discovery of the antibiotic the lead to the side of the relief that now the new bacteria will reside in this planet. With time, the bacteria have become smarter and developed resistance against the most of the antibiotics we use. So you can see in this picture here, the penicillin was uh, approved by the FDA in the 1943, but first report of the resistance was in 1940. Similarly, in the case of the streptomycin, FDA approval was taken in the 1947. At the same year, the resistance against streptomycin was reported. Tetracycline in the 1952, it was uh, FDA approved was in 1952 and resistance was reported in the 1956. Similarly, in the case of the methicillin, 1960 was approved, 1961 resistance developed. Nitric acid in the 1964 FDA approval was taken, but resistance was developed after two years, that is 1966. Gentamicin, uh, after two years, resistance was reported. For the vancomycin, it takes almost uh, 10, 12 years for the vancomycin, 1972. It was FDA approved and the resistance was reported in 1987, sorry. Cephotaxin, 1981. FDA approval was taken and the first reported case of resistance was in 1981 for the MC beta lactamase and for the extended spectrum beta lactamase resistant organism against cephotaxim is reported in 1983. Linezolid 2000 FDA approval was taken but already it's one year before it was report first report case of the resistant was in 1999. Next slide. So what causes the antibiotic resistance then? Antibiotic itself promotes antibiotic resistance. If a patient taking a course of the antibiotic treatment does not complete it, or he or she forgets to take the doses regularly, then resistance strains get a chance to build up. Next slide. Antibiotic pressure and the Resistance in the bacteria also promotes the antibiotic resistance. The antibiotics also kill the innocent non-pathogens are, which are inside our body. And this reduces the competition for the resistance pathogens. The use of the antibiotics also promotes the antibiotic resistance in the non-pathogens also. These non-pathogens may later pass the resistant genes onto the pathogens. So next slide. Transposons and the integrons. So resistant genes are often associated with the transposons. Transposons are the genes that easily move from the one bacterium to another. So many bacteria also possess the integrons and these integrons are the pieces of the DNA that can accumulate the new genes. Gradually a strand of a bacterium can build up a whole range of the resistant genes and because of this, the group to the other strains or the other species of the bacteria also. Next slide.
Another important factor for the resistance is the plasmids. Plasmids are the extra chromosomal DNAs, which is present in the some bacteria. So in this picture, you can see the plasmid PLW1043. This is a kind of the plasmid. And a single plasmid can carry the genes to resist the many different antibiotics. And in this picture, we can see this plasmid carrying trimethoprim resistant gene, penicillin family resistant gene also, vancomycin resistance, streptomycin resistance, even though the disinfectant resistant genes also carry. And also this plasmid also carrying the, those kind of the genes to help the plasmid to spread on, among the other bacterial species also. So next slide. Now coming to multi-drug resistance. So multiple drug resistance is, multiple drug resistance means uh, any organism to resist the different kinds of the, the different classes of the drugs or the chemicals of the wide variety of the structure and the function targeted to eradicate the particular organism. So multiple drug resistant organisms are the, those bacteria that have become resistant to the shortened antibiotics and these antibiotics can no longer be used to control or kill the same bacteria. The next slide. So according to this article, or according to the CDC and the ECDC, multidrug resistance is defined as the acquired non-susceptibility to at least one agent in three or more antimicrobial categories. Next slide. So multi-resistance to the different antibiotics generally result from a combination of the different independent mechanism of the resistance. As for example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is a type of the multi-resistant bacteria. It is resistant to beta-lactam. That means it is naturally resistant to beta-lactam, but it also So MRSA, they become resistant to the most of the antibiotics and with the frequency of the high resistance. And methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is generally Staphylococcus aureus is uh, resistance to methicillin is, and this kind of the resistance is generally acquired. This is not the natural one. Next slide. So causes of the resistance in the multiple drug resistance bacteria are, first of all, the production of the different kinds of the enzymes, and these enzymes is usually degrade the drugs. And mutation at the binding site to bypass the action of the drugs, down regulation or the altering of the outer membrane proteins, we say as a OMP system, these outer membrane proteins prevents the drugs to entry into the bacterial cell. So it cannot uh, reach to the uh, target site and it cannot destroy the bacteria. Eplox pumps that prevents the drugs reaching the intracellular target. And another one's most important factor is the acquisition of the resistant genes. As, and the, these resistant genes are acquired by means of the conjugation, transformation, and the transduction process. And this is the horizontal gene transfer, uh, gene transfer process of the bacteria. Next slide. Next slide, please. These are the previous slide, previous slide, please. These are the two studies that was done in the early uh, 1960s, and which was, pub one was published in the Nature in the 1968. In this uh, article, you can see here in the picture, there is a no R factor. The R factor means resistance factor in the 57 enterobacteriaceae from the South Africa, that's Kalahari Busman. And another is a published Another article was published in the Lancet in 1969. At that time also, only the 
among the 40 enterobacteria C, only the two in the two enterobacteria C, but the resistance factors were found in the two enterobacteria C. And this is in the Solomon Island. So next slide. So comparing to the 1960s and the now, it's now 2013, in the G8 summit, it was said at that time, it, uh, in, an article was published in the Independent. The, here the chief medical officer says, resistance to the antibiotics risks health catastrophe to rank with the terrorism and the climate change. Next slide. So that's why antibiotic resistance poses a big threat to the global health. Again, next slide. So antibiotic resistance will kill the more people than the cancer and diabetes combined by 2050. And how resistance and the develops and the spread, you can see in this picture here, the Antibiotics are used as fertilizing into antibiotic resistance manure. 80% of the, all the antibiotics which are given to the livestock is mostly to speed their growth as a growth promoter or to prevent the disease to them. And 50% of the, all the antibiotics given to the humans are prescribed unnecessarily or used inappropriately. And the manure, this encourages the proliferation of the antibiotic resistant bacteria when they are applied as a fertilizer in the agriculture. And so antibiotics itself we consume inappropriately and the livestock also we consume. And these all initiates for the antibiotic resistance to the humans. So next slide. So this is the a One Health approach. That's why we need a One Health approach for the, to combat with the antimicrobial resistance. Widespread use of the antibiotics in the animals either as a growth promoters or as the Prophylaxis may drive to spread of the clinically ready when drug resistant genes and the pathogens. So this is an article published on the you know, research which was based on the One Health approach. The next slide. WHO report in the 2017, WHO reported that the world is running out of the antibiotics. So this is a report based on the, the next slide. So in this picture, we can see here, the, this cartoon says the crisis is mostly invisible. So antibiotic resistance crisis, we cannot see here now. Usually we still do have at least one antibiotic active for the each patients, but there's no antibiotics, no new antibiotics in the market and the resistance is on the rise. We all know about that. So expert says we can fall at any time. So next slide. So that's why the 68th World Health Assembly in the May 2015 has formulated a global action plan. So antimicrobial resistance is occurring everywhere in the world, compromising our ability to treat the infectious disease as well as undermining the many other advances in the health and the medicine. That's why the global action plan is urgently needed. Next slide. Because the, our medicine is antibiotic, dependent. Next slide. So this is a simple example of the E. coli. E. coli, we all is familiar with this bacteria. All of us know that this bacteria is a normal inhabitant of our, in our intestinal tract. It can cause the simply the urinal tract infection and also it may cause the severe bacteremia. Because antibiotics are so effective, we have forgotten how serious things can be. Now, the many of the E. coli have become into 2017. In this period, we see the third generation cephalosporin in the ESBL, that is in the form of the ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing Escherichia coli are developed in between in this period. We also uh, uh, reported about the, we also see the many reports of the carbapenem resistant Escherichia coli. And even though in the early in 2019 and 20, even though the cholesterol resistant Escherichia coli are reported from the some parts of the world. So how serious is the problem is now? Next slide. So the consequences of the antimicrobial resistance now. So compromised therapy or the, for the on different human infections. 
there is serious complication for the elderly people as well as for the children. And because of the antimicrobial resistance, there is increased length of the therapy and the, we have to go for the more doctor visits. Prolonged hospital stay and uh, obviously there's a significant increase of the treatment cost. That's why the bacterial resistance is a major threat to public health. Next slide. This is a research article published on uh, published in 2009. Here, the increasing resistance, this is a serious and a global problem because the infection with a resistant organism result in higher morbidity, higher mortality, prolonged hospitalization, and the excess financial burden. Next slide. So the poverty and the prevalence of the antimicrobial resistance is correlated to each other. This article says about this. So next slide. So antimicrobial resistance, why some, why some countries has the, this much antimicrobial resistance? And the, like our country, this is the, there is a high rate of antimicrobial resistance because the major contribution of the antimicrobial resistance is a poor governments and the corruption to this growing problem. Next slide. Now we have the, some hope to combat with the antimicrobial resistance and the one is the antimicrobial resistance surveillance system that we are participating, our country is also participating in this program. So next slide. Objectives of the AMR surveillance is to recognize the problem of antimicrobial resistance, AMR, to detect the emergence of the AMR and monitor the resistance patterns, to trace the source and the spread of the drug resistance, to implement measures for the prevention of AMR, to formulate appropriate antibiotic policy guidelines, to provide susceptibility data to physicians for the directing the therapy, to interpret and integrate the resistance data to everyday practice of the medicine, and to develop the awareness among the public and the physicians regarding the AMR and the rational drug use. Next slide. So lab-based AMR surveillance is going on in our country also, and how is it working here? It was started in 1999 with the nine laboratories monitoring only the six pathogens of interest at that time. Currently, seven provinces are also included here. The 22 hospitals laboratories, I think more are also adding over it, are included in the AMR surveillance, monitoring the 10 organism of the interest. And these 10 organisms are categorized as enteric fever and the food poisoning organisms, such as the salmonella species. Diarrheal illness is a cisella and the vibrio cholerae. Bloodstream and the respiratory infectious organisms are streptococcus pneumoniae and hemophilus influenzae. For the STTs, Nigeria, Gonori, complicated UTI, extended spectrum, beta lactamase producing Escherichia coli. Nosocomial pathogens are MRSA, MDR Klebsiella, and the MDR Acinetobacter species. So in the 1999, six organisms, Cisella, Vibrio, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Hemophilus, and Nigeria are included. From 2002, uh, I think from the 2001, the Farakpur Chitavan outbreak of the Salmonella, at that time, the enteric fever, Salmonella typhi and the paratyphi was included in this uh, surveillance. And from 2009, ESB production in producing E. coli were added. From 2013, MRSA was added in this surveillance system. And from the 2016, MDR Acinetobacter and the MDR Klebsiella were added. So next slide. And these organisms were selected because of the this classification of the WHO. WHO has put the medium priority organisms in the Cisella species that is fluorocoilonin resistance, ampicillin resistance, hemophilus influenzae, and penicillin non-susceptible streptococcus pneumonia were uh, taken as a medium priority. High priority was given for the fluorocoilonin resistant salmonella, clarithromycin resistant helicobacter pylori, vancomycin resistant enterococcus fasciam, Third generation cephalosporin and the chlorofluoroquinone resistant Nigeria gonorrhea, fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter, vancomycin resistant and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. These three organisms in a high priority and a critical priority was given for the carbapenem and the third generation cephalosporin resistant Enterobacteriaceae. 
carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumani. But among them, the distinct organisms are selected for the AMR surveillance system of our national network. So next slide. So these are the sentinel site of the seven provinces, provinces for the AMR surveillance. Next slide. And how the surveillance system is going on nowadays in our countries at the site, sample received and the process following the standard microbiological technique. Organism of the interest are isolated, identified and reported along with the AST pattern. And monthly data on the ASD along with the 10% of the isolates are sent to the NPHL. NPHL verifies the isolates and the send feedback. And data from the, all the Sentinel sites are compiled, analyzed, and disseminated annually. So next slide. So this is the national status of the AMR surveillance network till 2018. 2019 and the 20 is still remaining. In the salmonella, resistance to ciprofloxacin in the salmonella has increased from 0% to 2005 to 79% by 2015. So decline in the MDR, that is 8% in 2010 to 1% by 2016. And chloram phenical sensitivity has re-emerged now. In Cisella and the Publio quality, change in the prevalence serotype in the Cisella and the Publio quality, around 50% and 60% of the Cisella and the Publio quality are multi-doc resistance respectively. So next slide. In the Streptococcus pneumonia, resistance to third generation cephalosporin increased from 0% to 9% in 2016. And in the 2016, 44% of the Streptococcus pneumonia were reported as MDR. In MRSA, ciprofloxacin resistance is raised 70% in 2013 to 87% 80, by 2017. And in the multiregulation acinetobacter, high resistance against the carbapenems that is 80 to 93%. So this is the 2018 data here that, uh, among the 2,600 isolates and most of the majority of the isolates are reported from the Kathmandu Model Hospital and the second one is BPKIH Staran. So next slide. This is the antibiogram of the salmonella species among the 463 salmonella isolates, both salmonella typhi and the salmonella paratyphi. So most of the salmonella species were resistant to the quinolones, such as ciprofloxacin and the levofloxacin also. Next slide. For the cisella species, among the Cisella species, the four uh, Cisella dysentery, Cisella flexneri, Cisella shoni were reported, and other Cisella species, as a Cisella species, uh, reported. And 31% of the Cisella isolates were MDR, exhibiting resistance to three or the more classes of the antibiotics. But all the isolates were found to be sensitive to chloramphenicol, gentamicin, and the cefixime. The next slide. For the pubrio quality, that is one isolate was resistance to the both septragon and the cefixim while the other was susceptible. So we do not have to worry about the Piburio cholerae till 2018. Next slide. For the streptococcus pneumonia, most of uh, total of the 80 streptococcus pneumonia were reported in the 2018 and most were isolated from the sputum and most of the cases were reported from the more than 60 years of the age group in both of the sexes. Next group, next slide. So streptococcus pneumonia isolates, among the 80 isolates, uh, most of the isolates were resistant to the erythromycin, clindamycin, and also the cotrimoxazole. Next slide. For the Haemophilus influenzae, only the eight Haemophilus influenzae isolates were reported in the year 2018 and all the isolates were susceptible to septragon, meropenum, and the azithromycin. Next slide. Nigeria gonori, the reported isolates exhibited 53% resistance to the ciprofloxacin and the 50% towards septragon. Next slide. So this is the antibiogram of the ESPL E. coli isolate from 2018 among the 657 ESPL producing E. coli isolate. Most of the E. coli isolate were resistant to the uh, beta-lactam inhibitor drugs that is amoxicillin clavulanic acid, 92% isolates were resistant to this 
amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Next slide. So the constant of the AMR surveillance program is like there is a lack in the communication between the human health veterinary and the other sectors. So it is very difficult to uh, the one health approach in our country. There is a lack of the regulatory bodies. There is no strict law against the violators and the lack of the good infrastructure and the dedicated human resource here. And under the problem is there is a lack of the national LMI system. So the data cannot be obtained for the actual picture of the AMR status of our country. The next slide. Now the way forward, national action plan was finalized, but it to be endorsed by the cabinet. And the another most important thing for us is the Fleming Fund grant is, called, is accepted for the country and the phase one is already, uh, you know, it was done. And the, now the, the phase two is running and this is for the developing the infrastructure and the building the laboratory capacity for the microbiology labs in the country. The next slide. So we all have a role to play to combat the antimicrobial resistance. So we have to put hands together to combat the antimicrobial resistance. So this is the take home message for today. Bacterial resistance might to be the major health problem ahead. It's a global ecological phenomenon. No part of the world will be sparse from the against the antimicrobial resistance. First, decrease massively the all unnecessary antibiotic uses. Next slide. However, let's not be too pessimistic. The situation of the AMR is highly critical, but we can stabilize at least AMR in the reducing poor uses of the antibiotics until new drugs or the treatments emerge on the market. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Any questions? Thank you, Basuda, for a great presentation. Does anyone have questions for uh, uh, Dr. Basuda? If you have a questions, please use the chat box. Otherwise, we can move ahead. I think we can move on. Okay. So, Linda. Hi, Linda. Yes. Yes. So, Dr. Madan Upadhyay from the Director of the Curative Division also online. So, I requested him to give the closing remarks. So, just for your kind information, Linda. Go okay. Ahead. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, and um, I just have this one um, short presentation, yeah. um, and then I think we'll be ready to close. So, um, okay. uh, and well, we also want to see if anyone has any final questions. So, yeah. uh, let's go ahead and, and move through this. Um, so, I, I want to talk about the WHO um, toolkit that they put together for hospital-based stewardship. Um, that the entire toolkit is available, um, you know, through our program. It's on the web. It's on the web web platform. Uh, it's also readily available um, through um, the internet. Um, so I just want to go through a little bit, just a couple slides about the, sort of what's in the toolkit. Um, but it should be seen as an important resource to thinking about uh, developing stewardship programs in hospitals in Nepal. Um, so. Um, Henry Ford and uh, GTA and um, other uh, groups in other countries worked together on a feasibility study of this toolkit um, about, I guess it was about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and input was given from a variety of people from uh, national level and hospital levels in terms of content for the toolkit. Uh, the toolkit's divided into three sections. One is structures, so the core elements that support stewardship, both in terms of at the national level and at the hospital level. Um, and as um, Dr. Basuda mentioned, um, she said that there is a national action plan on AMR. 
that has been developed in Nepal, uh, which is weighting endorsement. Um, so these structures are, are, are based very much on, um, and this toolkit is very much based on um, the global action plans and national action plans um, across, the, across the globe. Um, the second section is on interventions, so stewardship programs and guidance on how to plan, perform, and assess um, interventions in hospitals. And then the third section is on education and training. Uh, next slide. So if we think about at the hospital level, what are the key elements to, or the core elements to uh, successful stewardship? Um, leadership, having the commitment of the leaders, uh, prior prioritizing um, antimicrobial stewardship programs within their hospitals. Human resources, as um, Dr. Pasuda mentioned, uh, within hospitals and outside of hospitals, um, stewardship is a responsibility of everyone. Uh, and so uh, this is not just um, a program focused on physicians. We're talking about everyone who's working in hospitals in terms of um, stewardship programs, infection control, et cetera. Uh, education and training uh, are important. Uh, and um, that's of course, one of the, what we are doing today. Uh, and we'll continue to, to work on education and training with our uh, partners in Nepal. Treatment guidelines, uh, Dr. Joshi uh, spoke of the guidelines. Uh, we did develop some guidelines that were specific for um, hospitals in Nepal. Um, and those guidelines are also available um, on the website. Monitoring systems, uh, surveillance, uh, and again, Dr. Pursuta, uh, gave an excellent presentation on um, uh, surveillance that's being done in Nepal and really the importance of that surveillance to know what are the changes, what's happening in terms of resistance, in terms of increases and decreases of pathogen resistance to different, um, different antibiotics. And then reporting and feedback. Uh, so again, uh, it's important to not only implement programs, but to get feedback from um, participants in the program and to use that feedback to improve the programs over time. Okay, next slide. So then in terms of different types of interventions, um, so there are multiple kinds. Of course, education is always a part of the intervention. This can be formal inter, uh, education like now, or it can be something more informal perhaps during uh, rounds in different wards where uh, champions can uh, talk about the importance of uh, stewardship programs and discuss uh, resistance in their hospitals. Uh, the treatment guidelines, again, feedback programs. This is a program that we've implemented in several hospitals uh, in Nepal, including Kathmandu Model and Kirtapur um, with a, a post-prescription feedback program. And to some extent, this is also a feedback program um, because we are tra training the physician champions that we hope that they will uh, work towards um, providing new information and sharing what they learn as part of this program with other um, physicians, nurses, and um, other healthcare providers in their hospitals. Um, there are structural interventions. Uh, this can just be self-revision by the prescriber. Uh, in some places, they'll have a computerized order entry uh, so that before certain antibiotics can be prescribed, then they need um, someone to approve that. Um, then they are restrictive. There uh, are some places and the, that have pre-authorization so that even before something is prescribed, um, someone in the hospital, usually in the US, that would be an infectious disease specialist, has to authorize the use of those antibiotics and then automatic stop orders that might come through pharmacies, for example, in terms of when a, um, what, as uh, Dr. Joshi said in his presentation, um, there are those reserve antibiotics. And so um, he, this is a, an important way to uh, decrease the use of those antibiotics. Um, 
the, on the uh, left hand side, uh, just in terms of, as I said, it's important to um, get feedback, to always um, use that feedback to improve your programs. So when the development of stewardship programs, it's important to prepare and plan, implement the program, then study it. Is it working? Um, how is it um, feasible to, um, to run within the settings that, um, of the hospital, and then to from that um, study, from that assessment, make decisions about how can we adjust it and and um, and make it better for the context in which it is being implemented. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. That's it. And then finally, education and training. Um, so the toolkit lists certain competencies and uh, the content for those competencies. And so in terms of developing CME programs or other lectures and series of trainings, um, they have an excellent guideline in terms of content for those trainings, but they also include online e-learning resources. Uh, and so that's an important piece as well. Um, so obviously um, our website is not the only resource on the web in terms of AMR. And um, this is a, using this um, information from the toolkit can help to expand the training um, in hospitals. So even if there isn't time within the um, hospital day, if there isn't room to have a large training, uh, it's important to uh, emphasize and support the use of e-learning resources among um, hospital staff. Next slide. Okay, so um, that so that's just a brief introduction. Again, that toolkit is available uh, on the website. Um, I would you know strongly suggest um, having a have an opportunity to look through it. There's a lot of important information. Uh, it is based on the global action plan uh, put out by WHO. And of course, the National Action Plan in Nepal is parallel and very similar in terms of um, what Nepal um, is um, looking to achieve in terms of decreasing resistance and increasing stewardship. Uh, so thank you. Um, any questions? Oh. Uh, next slide. So if, does anyone have any comments or questions about the training before we um, go to our closing? Okay, so uh, okay. Uh, Deepak, Linda, shall we yeah. go ahead and- Just a second. Yeah, uh, very nice uh, presentation, Linda. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, regarding this training, like uh, today, uh, we had two hours. Uh, this. Regarding like uh, what next, like we have the next so, uh, episode of training or we can highlight on that. So the next step is that um, uh, the, we were, will be asking um, the champions to go through the web-based training. Uh, and so, uh, and um, we will send out information uh, to all of the champions in terms of going through that training. Uh, and so that goes into more detail um, than we can obviously cover in um, a brief training, um, a virtual training like this. Uh, so this is just kind of an introduction to the themes that we um, have, uh, that we feel are important in terms of resistance and stewardship. Um, but I think it's something close, it's 2021 modules within the training program, uh, as well as a, a couple of lectures, one uh, that was given to both by Dr. Gina. Um, one is uh, just an overview of, similar to what she did today, but a little bit longer, but she also has, a, including a lecture on AMR and COVID. So, um, so really the next step will be um, going through the modules within the website. And then once that is done, actually implementing um, some change within the hospitals in terms of champions, um, you know, taking what they learn uh, and seeing how they can implement it within their own hospital setting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, in the model, uh, one second. In the model, uh, we have a, like a guideline also. So you know, champion can use that guideline and give their comment also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're right. Right. So the we uh, uh, Dr. Joshi talked about the guidelines. He showed that one example, um, but the full guidelines are available on the website as well. Yeah. Guidelines is available in the website also, and if anybody interested to know about more cartoon model or field guidelines, they can ask us so we can send the guidelines also. But uh, after some time, you have to develop your own guidelines depending on your, you know, uh, microbiology lab status and then mm -hmm. the in your hospital that has to be separate, a different one. But the request is please forward the guideline to all so that we can familiar with this guideline and we can compare with our own guideline. What is yeah. different and how we use it? Thanks. Let's talk how we can check that. Any other? Uh, thank you, Dr. Yadav. Uh, any other questions? Did Dr. Was here or no? Today is absent. Uh, he had he had to be in clinic. Okay, so. He didn't realize it yesterday, but today they called him into clinic. So he was. So there is a message in the per, uh, in the chat box. So Linda, can you the Pradeep Mishra? Nice presentations. There are a lot of causes of EMR and particularly in contents of Nepal. What are the main causes, Dr. Joshi? Um, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Joshi uh, or Dr. Basuda, can you talk about that? Uh, Dr. Pradeep, you know, thank you for asking these questions. Like everywhere, others like we are, we are talking about the why uh, material antibiotic resistance occurs because of the rampant use of the antibiotics, where there is no restrictions, where there is no indications, and when we use antibiotics, also, also we don't think about the duration. How long it has to be used? So we stop it in between. Also, or we sometimes use more than uh, and prolonged time more than what is necessary. So I think many what in Nepal like antibiotics comparatively to other countries is very cheap, readily available in the market. In over the counter, you can get it. You don't need prescription also. So what in our we, what we have to think is like we have to restrict use of using antibiotics, not only in the hospitals, but outside setting also. We have to talk to our government that that antibiotic has rampantly used in, you know, uh, veterinary, uh, you know, animal, you know, like in the animal farming, like in the chicken farming here also, fishery also. That has been lots of use of antibiotics. That has to be stopped. And when we talk about using antibiotics by the healthcare professional also, uh, when, like in the United States, even second or third generation cephalosporin, if they want to use this, then they have to get a permission from the higher up, either infectious disease controller or senior consultant only. In Nepal, we use it rampantly, very sorry to say that, even in the health assistant in any remote place also, they have been using that. So I think the rampant use of the antibiotic, overage of antibiotic, that is the main cause in Nepal. I think, uh, yeah. uh, Mishka, I give you the reply, answer. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. And and uh, um, I want to, I do want to mention that um, uh, we were something we were going to start last year, but because of COVID, we were unable to start. Um, but this year, uh, we will are planning on training of um, people in the community, so pharmacists. Uh, nurses, midwives, um, so uh, training around AMR and stewardship in the community, because we know that actually a, a majority of antibiotics are um, distributed, dispensed within communities. Um, and so um, that's sort of our next step is to focus on the communities as well. Uh, thank you, Joshi sir. Uh, uh, I'm very much impressed with one of the slides presented by Dr. Basundara. Uh, there is clearly mentioned that uh, poor governments is one of the cause for AMR. So that is a very much uh, uh, 
very much right or very much 100% true for in context of Nepal. And uh, my another suggestion is that uh, everyone should know what is the uh, importance of antibiotics and how we have to preserve antibiotics in future. So these kind of issues has to be included in uh, school teaching programs also, mm -hmm. in, even mm -hmm. in curriculums, no? so that uh, by uh, SLC giving peoples or the uh, lower secondary student, they have to know importance of antibiotics and uh, future generations, uh, future generations may aware about that, uh, how long we have to take antibiotics or should we take antibiotics or not? You know? So, so this, this, this chapter has to be included in curriculum also, education curriculum. Uh, Dr. Mishra, I think in the National Action Plan, it is included. Once it is indoors, it is also in the school curriculum, it also comes to school curriculum. But yeah, thank you. That's a, an important point. Uh, is it, It's very important to start uh, this education <laughs> before uh, people are going into practice, uh, but um, have it as a part of curriculums in yeah. nursing, medical schools, et cetera. Any other comments or questions? Okay, Deepak, do you want to? Uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, you know, because Madan Upadhyay, he is a new director for the curative division. He's supposed to join in the day before the kickoff meeting, but he will not because of some problem. So now, uh, Linda, can you give a little bit of overview of the our programs, then the modern, modern, Dr. Modern will have some idea that uh, we'll request to Modern to give the closing remarks. Okay. okay. The Thank you, Deepak. Uh, so just briefly, uh, we started working in Nepal um, on uh, antimicrobial resistance in uh, 2014, 2015. And we started um, with uh, some programs, post-prescription review and feedback programs. And um, our first hospitals we worked um, were uh, Kathmandu Model and uh, Kirtipur Hospital. Uh, and the program was very successful. Um, thanks very much to Dr. Toshi, Dr. Rai, who um, were um, local leaders in, in, the, in the development and implementation of the program. We then went on and um, we continued the program in Kathmandu and Model and Kirtipur, and then we provided training also in Pokhara um, Health Academy. And um, again, that was a very successful program. That was a program that focused on wound and burn care, which is a major issue and and uh, and and in which um, resistance is a severe problem, not only in Nepal but um, throughout um, at a global level. Uh, so we implemented that program, and then uh, so we moved on to this. Uh, uh, Deepak uh, and uh, uh, myself and, and others at Henry Ford, we felt like one way to expand our training would be through a web-based platform. So we implemented the platform uh, last year. Uh, it was delayed by COVID, but we were, were able to uh, implement and pilot the program in November, December of 2020. Uh, and we had approximately 155, 156 participants um, go through the program. And so this is the second year of that uh, training. Uh, we are expanding the program so that we train uh, our AMR champions who are both physicians and nurses so that they will um, they are participating in this virtual training um, they will also participate in the web uh, platform training um, they, we will continue to have some of these uh, synchronous activities in terms of touching base with our champions and um, having our champions and uh, leaders like Dr. Joshi uh, and Dr. Basuda um, who support us in this, um, moving towards uh, using the, the information that is learned by the champions to um, push forward stewardship uh, interventions in hospitals in Nepal. 
uh, and also um, to develop, a, this is sort of a first step towards developing a telemedicine program whereby uh, experts uh, in AMS, uh, experts in um, resistance can help other physicians um, prescribe uh, antibiotics that are appropriate for um, the specific uh, condition and uh, decrease use of um, the reserve antibiotics, reduce duration of use, et cetera. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, this is the first training for the physician champions in our uh, second year of the Glamour Project. And as I mentioned, we are also this year going to move out into the community and provide training um, to community pharmacists, nurses, and midwives. Deepak, anything you want to add? Great overview. Just for this telemedicine, uh, we are working with uh, four hospitals. Uh, one is the far western region, city uh, provincial hospital and eastern part BPKIS hospital. In the central region, we are working with the uh, Kathmandu model and the Kritikur hospital. Dr. Martin, for your kind information. So, uh, Dr. Martin, do you have any questions or maybe we are going to now closing out session? No, it's okay. Okay. So now I would like to request Dr. Madan Upadhyay. He is the director of the Curative Division Ministry of Department of Health Service, Ministry of Health, for uh, for closing remarks. Then the, after his closing remarks, then the final final closing. I would like to request to Dr. Joshi. Followed by so Dr. Madan Upadhyay. Uh, thank you, uh, Deepak sir. I want to congratulate and thanks uh, Dr. Basuda. GTA and Linda for the nice presentation and uh, thank all the champions. I think uh, there are a lot of things to be done. Uh, we are still in the endorsement of NAP uh, and I don't think this AMR uh, uh, we should be having a blame game. It's multi-sectoral and multi-functional approach uh, we all are responsible for AMR and AMS, which we have started with a very good initiation. There are a lot of things to be done by government also and by uh, public-private partnership and multi-sectors, we can go ahead. We all know the reason behind AMR uh, and we have to mitigate it. So I think we all should be moving towards uh, with positive vibe that we can achieve uh, uh, this uh, uh, challenge and we will uh, minimize uh, antimicrobial resistance to AMS. Thank you uh, for giving me chance and uh, letting me uh, with you all. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, and, Dr. Uh, Madan. Thank yeah. you. And uh, I will come Thank to you. you to and good evening. Deepak, go ahead. Good evening and congratulations. Thank you. So I would like to request Dr. Joshi to for closing closing remarks. You know, thank what of thanks. Yeah, so today we have quite a nice you know training session. So this is the initial one for the Yama Champion training. We are very nice to have started from Dr. Nina, then Nina also. I got a talk, uh, sort of overview of antibiotic prescribing guidelines, and Dr. Basuda has talked quite a lot extensively about the antibiotic resistance, how the bacterial resistance comes, and why EMR at risk. How can EMR be addressed like that? So, this is very, very interesting. <coughs> And when I mean, uh, Dr. Linda also talked about the WHO antimicrobial laboratory to toolkit also. Now, this uh, the Glamour 2, with this, with our three different uh, journal, I mean, province hospitals and uh, so many champions for antimicrobial laboratory program, I think we can do quite a lot and we can show, I mean, to tell our government also how, how, the dangerous this antibiotic resistance and 
with this Ishtavatri, how can we do better? And how can we can preserve our this, uh, you know, pipeline few last resort antibiotics like that? So I think we'll have a nice talk in next time also. We'll have from now on, I think Deepak will tell us, Mr. Deepak will tell us whether we'll have a in the website, we'll be having all the discussions about this. So this is very interesting and uh, two hours, it just went through like that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all the uh, Henry for our hospital team. Thank you, GTA and all our champions and our consultants from this last program. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Joshi. So, Linda, do you have anything to share or maybe we'll close it now? Uh, no, I, th I think um, we'll close up. Um, we're just about within, um, we're a little bit, um, finished a little early, so that's good. Uh, I know it's getting late there in Nepal. So I just wanna thank everyone for participating today. Um, and of course, uh, especially wanna thank our present presenters, Dr. Joshi and Dr. Basuda uh, and um, Dr. Gina, who I think is off the line now um, for providing uh, the real content that was um, so important to this presentation, so. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your evening. And uh, we will um, be in touch both by email and um, through, you know, providing more information in terms of next steps uh, for the collaborative program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.